Uh, welcome everyone. Before introducing our esteemed speaker, there are some housekeeping items. Um, we are right now bro broadcasting live via live stream and YouTube. Uh, you can use the microphones to ask questions. The recording is always available for your viewing. And um, I would strongly encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notifications when new videos are added. And for our host today, if you would like to submit a question, text DeBakey to 37607. And you may also submit questions via the live stream feed uh, on livestream.com, hmh.edu. And as a part of uh, introduction, uh, I want to notify that we have two conferences coming up in June. Uh, Pre-intern training for vascular residents, June 5th to 7th, and more importantly, an, an amazing course for the non-cardiologists, which is around cardiology, June 17th. So now moving on, um, uh, I would say today is one of my greatest honor to introduce our key speaker for today, Dr. Ron Blankstein who and I have been working together since 2007 and um, I believe he's one of the most thoughtful energetic and balanced academic cardiologists very few individuals have the combined expertise in multimodality imaging tied with preventive cardiology as you as you would know as an associate director of cardiovascular imaging program he's the director for cardiac CT program he co-directs the cardiovascular imaging training program and also is a senior physician in preventive cardiology at Brigham and Women Hospital, has mentored well over 100 academic cardiologists, published now more than 550 papers that have impacted practice, also steered multiple national guidelines, and his web of influence continued to grow. Dr. Blankstein, current research also is NIH funded core lab on plaque quantification, specifically on techniques to assess and measure serial changes in corneal plaque. He also finds time for giving back to our societies. He's the past president of the Society of Cardiac CT, has served on the board of director for, um, and currently on the board of director for American Society of Preventive Cardiology. He's also the a chair of the ACC Imaging Section Leadership Council. He's previously served on the board of directors for American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. He's also an associate editor of JAC uh, and on the editorial board of Journal of Nuclear Cardiology and Circulation Imaging. So clearly he's the classic, but I would say a really found triple threat with superb clinical acumen, excellent teaching skills and unrivaled research creativity and productivity. I have no idea, Ron, how you are able to manage all of this successfully, but knowing him personally, what I admire the most that this has been accomplished without compromise to his personal attributes, respect for peers, and his family life. Uh, moreover, he's an amazing source of mentorship and support to me and many of around us, um, a truly wonderful human being for whom I'm very grateful to have crossed paths. And Ron, thank you so much for uh, joining us today live. All over to you. Coram, thank you. That is such a, a, a generous and kind introduction. Um, and, and certainly if I've had some success uh, in my career, you have been a very big part of it. Um, and it's a really, uh, really an honor to, to join you all, albeit uh, remotely for today, uh, at Houston Methodist, a program that I know uh, very well and I have many, many friends in the program who I know are listening right now. Uh, in a program which I consider one of the top cardiovascular imaging programs in the, in the country or world. So uh, I think I'm speaking to a, to a group of experts today. Uh, and for today's topic, I am going to talk about coronary CT and geography, how we use it in clinical cardiology and in prevention. I am actually not going to talk much about calcium scoring because uh, I think uh, as an audience, uh, you are well versed in it uh, because uh, I feel uh, uh, probably put together as an institution and was the leadership of Dr. Nasir uh, probably most of the, the contemporary articles in, in that area. So uh, we'll proceed. And uh, this slide here shows my uh, disclosures. Uh, they're mostly relevant for uh, uh, the fact that I consulted companies that uh, work with uh, plaque analysis and uh, also advise uh, uh, pharma on how to use imaging in clinical trials. I'll start with a case to kind of get us warmed up. Um, Coronary CTA. Here's a 59-year-old male. Uh, 
family history of coronary disease, but despite that, he was advised by his primary care physician not to be on any uh, therapy uh, if he didn't want to. LDL was uh, was 106, and he was told your cholesterol is actually in good range. You're, you're doing just fine. That is until he had some atypical chest discomforts presented uh, to our uh, uh, to a cardiologist had a coronary CTA, uh, which you can see on this slide here. This slide here shows the LED. You can see a small amount of calcified plaque where my pointer is at the very beginning of the LED, and then a larger proportion of non-calcified plaque. So this was in interpreted uh, as a mild stenosis, which means 25 to 49 percent. We never on coronary CTA give the exact percent stenosis, but we kind of give a category. Um, the classifications we use is a system known as CAD-RADS. And I would add that RADS does not stand for radiology. People often ask me that. It's for reporting and diagnosis system. So in, throughout imaging, there are different reporting systems, and there's now one for coronary CTA. But in addition to describing that he has mild stenosis, we also describe that he has a large amount of a plaque, and that's when considering both the calcified and non-calcified plaque. In every coronary CTA, we now give a recommendation based on this uh, CAD-RADS document, which we'll go into a little bit later in the talk. And the recommendation on this report was aggressive risk factor modification in preventive pharmacotherapy. Um, so, of course, I'm always interested is the, do the tests that we do, like coronary CTA, actually impact patient care? Um, and when I uh, looked into the chart of this patient a couple of weeks later, I saw this very brief note. Uh, results of coronary CTA reviewed was a patient will start high dose stan and aspirin for primary prevention. So I show this example because uh, I think it emphasizes also the importance of communicating results um, and also the hope that many of us have is that people actually act on the results of imaging tests, uh, both clinicians and our and our patients. Here's another case of 61 year old male with psoriasis, and I think many of you recognize that psoriasis now is a well known risk factor for coronary disease. He presented to our hospital with chest pain. He underwent a SPECT perfusion imaging study, which was normal, but he kept on having pain. So his cardiologist astutely ordered a coronary CTA, which identified uh, essentially severe three vessel disease, including left main stenosis and severe stenosis in the LED circumflex and RCA. But what I think is interesting in this case is a technique that I will be covering later in the talk known as fat attenuation index, where we can look at the fat around the coronary arteries and infer if there's actually inflammation in the coronaries. And in this particular case, we did this more for, for a research perspective. This is not something that we use clinically yet, but we saw a very abnormal signal, uh, which actually puts them at, at uh, above the 90th percentile for level of inflammation. So those are cases just to kind of get us uh, thinking about coronary CTA. And I would uh, uh, tell you that if you haven't really paid a lot of attention to coronary CT, perhaps you're busy in the cath lab or EP lab or doing other things in cardiology, which we all are, uh, uh, maybe in 2021, you'll all of a sudden realize, well, maybe this test is actually a useful test if you paid attention to the guidelines. And in 2021, we had in the US the first time a guideline that was specifically focused on uh, the evaluation of chest pain. This was a, a guideline that was written from scratch. We never in the past had a guideline on chest pain. It addressed both stable and acute chest pain. And in this guideline, coronary CTA had a class one recommendation for both stable and acute chest pain was a level of evidence or what we call the LOE, which was A, which was the strongest level of evidence. And in fact, it was the only imaging test that got a level of evidence of A. And the reason for that is over 20 uh, randomized uh, uh, studies with cardiac CT and stable and acute chest pain. So a lot of evidence supporting this, and this is why it has such a, uh, a strong recommendation in the guideline. Now, of course, all the imaging tests actually, when done in the right scenario, ended up having a class one recommendation, almost all the imaging tests, I, I would say. So for all of us uh, who practice clinical cardiology, the real question is how do we choose between CT and stress test? Uh, and I would tell you that it can be challenging. First, we have to start with the fact that in patients who don't have known coronary disease, we should only test when patients have an intermediate to high pretest probability of obstructive disease. 
In other words, if the risk of obstructive disease is low, our guidelines state that you can defer testing or perhaps do a calcium score or perhaps do an exercise treadmill test. Those are actually level 2A recommendations. However, if a patient needs testing in that intermediate to high pretest probability, you can choose between CT and stress testing. And you always have to consider the local availability and expertise. But if you go to a place like Houston Methodist, you guys are experts at all the modalities and you have everything available. Um, so how, how should you choose? Well, there's no hard uh, factors that will tell you one test is, should be selected over another, but instead there's some considerations that you should pay attention to. So, for example, in individuals who happen to be younger, and we can argue what the age is for that, I don't think there's an absolute age, but generally under 65 to 70, if those individuals are not on optimal preventive therapies, uh, we wrote in the guideline that perhaps CTA might be preferable, because after all, in those individuals, if we find plaque, that's going to impact how we treat those patients. On the other hand, in individuals who have a higher likelihood of ischemia or older, perhaps you can't get a good quality CT, perhaps you know that there's a lot of coronary calcifications from a prior chest CT, in those ind individuals, a stress test might be preferred. You also have to think about the objective of the test. If the objective is to rule out obstructive disease or to identify non-obstructive plaque, CTA is preferred. If the objective is, on the other hand, uh, to do what we call ischemia-guided management, which is to see how much ischemia individuals have, because after all, that might help support that their symptoms are actually due to ischemia. In that case, a stress test would be preferred. Of course, the guideline goes into some options of how to choose between stress tests, but that's beyond the scope of today's talk. The other important thing is to always consider the results of prior tests. So if a patient previously had a stress test that was not very revealing or perhaps was non-diagnostic for a particular reason, a coronary CTA this time around would be a better test. And of course, vice versa. If a coronary CTA was not diagnostic, don't do another coronary CTA when that patient presents again. Think of a different type of test. So hopefully some of this makes sense, uh, but these are just factors to consider when you select between these. For the next couple of slides, I wanna cover some of the advantages of coronary CT and geography. The first advantage is that coronary CTA is a very rapid exam. The actual image acquisition only takes a couple seconds and it's very safe. We're not stressing the heart. Uh, we are sometimes giving beta blockers to uh, slow down the heart rate. We may give nitroglycerin to dilate the coronary arteries, but overall very well tolerated exam by just about anyone. It's also a highly accurate exam. And for over 15 years, we've always uh, uh, talked about the negative predictive value, meaning that if a coronary CTA has no plaque and no stenosis, it's incredibly reassuring. Uh, in fact, I would say it's the most reassuring test in all of clinical cardiology in patients with chest pain when it is negative. Uh, in fact, more so than a negative cath, I would argue, because CTA can show plaque that you might not detect on invasive angiography. Um, of course, we can debate that. Uh, that's when the image quality is, is good. But just as the negative predictive value is good, I would tell you that the positive predictive value for identifying stenosis is also good. And CTA can look at a whole spectrum of stenosis. And as you can see on the right side of this slide, ranging from minimal, mild, moderate, severe, or even an occluded vessel. So it's not just about ruling out disease. It's also telling us when obstructive disease is present, um, it, of course, it depends on the clinical context. But probably the greatest advantage of coronary CTA is that it can detect non-obstructive plaque, the type of plaque that we would not be able to know that patients have when we did another test, perhaps unless we did a calcium score, which we would add to other stress tests, which is something that the guidelines also now recommend. When we talk about the chest pain guideline, one of the things that's important to note is that the presence of non-obstructive plaque is now uh, classified as artery disease. This is the very first time in any US guideline that non-obstructive plaque actually counts as coronary disease. And we now have a class one recommendation that when non-obstructive uh, plaque is present, we should optimize preventive therapy. It's a class uh, one recommendation, but when we talk about how we identify non-obstructive plaque, there's specifically three ways to do that. One of them is a coronary CTA, 
You can do a calcium uh, score, including in low-risk symptomatic patients, something that the guidelines give a 2A recommendation. Or perhaps if you know that the patient has plaque because they had a prior chest CT done for non-cardiac reasons. Um, so it doesn't really matter how you identify the plaque. Once you know that a patient has a plaque, uh, our guidelines recommend to optimize preventive therapy. Because the reality is that most of our patients who have plaque either don't know about it or are not in any preventive therapy, let alone optimize preventive therapies. So let's talk a little bit about why plaque identification is important. I think this is a, an important area to cover. I remember when I was a, a fellow nearly 20 years ago, I was told that plaque actually doesn't matter a whole lot because everybody just gets plaque when they get older. So the only thing that matters is uh, you know, looking for uh, ischemia, and we really shouldn't care about calcifications. Um, and I actually think based on the data that was available 20 years ago, the, the folks who taught me that probably weren't way off. They just didn't have the data that we have today. So why is plaque identification important? I'll give you four reasons on this uh, slide. First is the fact that most stress tests that we do in the US, particularly 95%, are normal, which means they're not gonna result in any changes in patient management. The second fact is that when we have patients who undergo stress tests and are followed prospectively, as was done in the PROMISE study, most events happen in patients who have a normal stress test. And it's not that the stress test is wrong, it's just that most of our stress tests are designed to identify flow-limiting coronary disease. Um, so if there isn't any, if there's a large amount of plaque, but it's not impacting a flow, that stress test will be normal. And statistically speaking, if most patients have a normal stress test and a proportion of those are going to have a large amount of plaque, it follows that most events are going to occur there because that's where the denominator is the largest. The third fact that I think we're only beginning to appreciate now is that plaque burden may predict risk better than stenosis. So this is uh, the study from Mortensen and, and colleagues that was published in 2021, which was a large population study in uh, Denmark, showed that once you accounted for how much plaque individuals have, and this was done using a calcium score, which is a very good surrogate for the overall amount of plaque, whether individuals had stenosis or not did not add to risk assessment. And there's been other studies showing this. So more and more we're recognizing it's not about stenosis, it's about how much plaque individuals have, or at least a combination of both of those factors. But the most important reason why identifying plaque is important is because it can improve outcomes. And that's exactly the mechanism of why we think outcomes were improved in the Scott Hart study, which was a large multi-center study in the UK, where adding coronary CTA on top of standard of care resulted in a 40% decrease in coronary heart disease uh, uh, death or myocardial infarction. And you can actually see uh, on the bottom left of this slide here, curve that continue to separate over time, which also argues for preventive therapies driving this change as opposed to some kind of change in management at baseline or sending patients for revascularization. So it's really the preventive therapies uh, uh, that were implemented and not just implemented, but implemented in patients who actually had disease uh, that we think made the difference and led for this important um, uh, re reduction in events. Based on everything I just showed you, uh, plaque burden is now something we should be reporting on every coronary CTA. Uh, and recently I had the pleasure of, uh, of uh, helping to lead this document, the CADRADS 2.0, uh, which is uh, advice for imagers on how we should report CTA findings and what recommendations to give clinicians. And I would share with you that the first version of CADRADS, which is now old, uh, the focus was just on stenosis. And I think the biggest modification in this 2.0 version is that we now state that we should also report how much plaque individuals have. It's not just about stenosis anymore. And specifically what we recommend is to give a, uh, a score, uh, I call this the P score ranging from P1, P2, P3 or P4, which is an estimation of how much plaque there is. Uh, of course, you don't have to do this if the coronary CTA is normal, but if there is plaque, we want now every, every reader to put this in the report and you have different options on how you're gonna do that. So um, some centuries use a calcium score in addition to every coronary CTA and you can use a calcium score to guide this. Uh, in my own institution, we don't do a calcium score in every coronary CTA. We don't find that all that helpful. 
You can, of course, look at something known as a segment involvement score, which is how many segments of the coronary tree have plaque, or you can just visually get an estimation of how much calcified and non-calcified plaque. It doesn't matter which method you use, and of course, they're going to vary. The important thing is we want every CTA reader now to put in the impression overall how much plaque individuals have. And this is something that can be done very quickly. This doesn't add a whole lot of time because after you read a coronary CTA, uh, this is not a detailed uh, analysis. Maybe in future versions, we will have detailed analysis and quantitative plaque. But at least for now, this is something that can be done quickly for every single coronary CTA. And the point here is that if an individual has severe amount of plaque, what we call a P3 or P4, what you might consider a calcium score greater than 300, we want to implement aggressive therapies. Now, often individuals ask, and maybe less so in 2023, but more so five years ago when I would give this talk, uh, people would say, so you just have to do this fancy CT just to know who needs to be on a statin. Do we really need to do coronary CTA to, to say who needs to be on a statin? And I would share with you as a, as a preventive cardiologist uh, that uh, today, aggressive preventive therapy uh, spans a whole lot more than statins. So if I see a patient that might have a P3 or P4 who has a very large plaque burden, or perhaps a patient with a very high calcium score, the things I would want to cover in clinic are, of course, lifestyle therapies, such as exercise and, and diet, particularly uh, uh, for in my clinic, that would be a recommendation for a predominantly plant-based diet or perhaps a Mediterranean diet, low in saturated fat and processed foods. Tobacco cessation, probably the single most important thing on this slide, probably has uh, a higher efficacy than all our therapies put together. More aggressive diabetes management. When patients have plaque, I'm far more likely to consider GLP-1 receptor agonists, especially if they also uh, are overweight. I'm going to shoot for more aggressive blood pressure lowering targets, uh, similar to the SPRINT trial. Uh, we'll think about antiplatelet agents. And even though we no longer recommend aspirin as much in what we call primary prevention when patients have a large amount of plaque. If they don't have uh, bleeding issues, we are going to consider antiplatelet agents. And of course, more aggressive lipid lowering therapies with lower targets and adding on top of statins when needed agents like PCSK9 inhibitors, maybe bempedoic acid now for our statin intolerant patients, icosapent ethyl, we, we are uh, using that as well for selected patients. Um, and in the future, other therapies, for example, therapies to lower lipoprotein A, which are currently in clinical trials, I think that the ideal population for that will ultimately be patients who have high LPA in plaque, but to start that before they actually develop events, because our current trials are only for patients who already had events. All right, so I think we, we covered plaque, and now uh, on this talk on coronary CTA, I want to uh, spend the next few slides talking about acute chest pain, because this is another way that we use coronary CT in geography. And I'll start with this case here, a 66-year-old male who presented to our emergency department with five days of exertional chest discomfort. And you can see here an EKG that uh, is fairly unremarkable, uh, a troponin, a uh, high sensitivity sensitivity troponin, I should say, which is less than assay, which of course would be very reassuring. And I may be tempted, I would say, to send this patient home if the high sensitivity troponin is negative, the EKG is negative. Of course, it depends a little bit on, on how impressed you are by the story. But if we turn to our chest pain guideline, there's a class one recommendation to use a gl clinical decision pathway, what we call a CDP. And that helps us uh, stratify the patient into low risk, which means they can be discharged, high risk, which means they should probably go to the cath lab, and intermediate risk, which is where more testing is needed. The clinical decision pathways uh, that are available in the U.S. are shown on the bottom part of this slide, and there are multiple ones. Um, and the one thing that they all have in common is how they define low risk, which generally means less than 1% a uh, 30-day event rate. The most common uh, uh, score, the one we use in my center, is the heart score. And here on the here on the right, you can see here the points that we added up for this patient uh, was the heart score. But he ends up being an intermediate risk patient when we consider his score and therefore eligible for more testing. Because this is a talk on coronary CTA, of course, I picked a case for someone who ultimately went for a coronary CTA. But I'll show you first in the, in the chest pain guideline, when we talk about acute chest pain patients, 
Also, we, uh, we reserve imaging for intermediate risk patients. Uh, uh, we discourage it in the low risk patients. And you can see on this slide that both for anatomical testing was coronary CTA and for stress testing, there's class one indications. Uh, and certainly you have to employ some judgment when selecting what's the best uh, test for an individual. And it depends on a lot on whether you're able to get good image quality with a coronary CTA. This patient underwent a coronary CTA and the results are shown on this slide here. Uh, and, they and his coronary CTA showed despite his uh, unrevealing EKG and completely normal high sensitivity troponin, he had an occlusion in his, uh, or a subtotal occlusion, I should say, in his RCA and also severe stenosis in his circumflex and diagonal. Some of the advantages when we use coronary CTA uh, in the emergency department uh, are that it's a rapid test. Most of our prospective randomized trials have shown that use of CTA decreases hospital lengths of stay. But I would add that in the current era with high sensitivity troponin, that advantage I think has kind of mostly gone away because we can now deploy other tests very quickly as well. So perhaps uh, that's less of, a, less of an impetus right now. Um, it is very accurate test in the ED, and studies have shown it when the coronary CTA is normal, uh, very reassuring. And then at times, we may be able to identify other alternative explanations for symptoms. And you can see on this slide, ranging from left to right, a pericardial effusion, hiatal hernia, an impressive coronary dissection that happened to extend into the left main, and on the right side, uh, penetrating uh, aortic plaque also at times can cause symptoms. So these are all important th things to consider. Of course, some of these are, are rare. What about patients who actually have elevation in their high sensitivity troponin? Could CT be useful for those patients? And I think that is a, a, a really good question because the answer is it depends. If we turn to the European guidelines, specifically the 2020 guidelines for management of acute coronary syndromes, uh, CTA has a class one indication in low to intermediate risk, what they call non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. Um, and specifically, uh, CTA's role here is when the troponin or EKG are inconclusive. So if someone has a definitive MI, uh, these guidelines do not recommend a CT, but at times you may have an elevation in troponin or EKG changes and it may not be a kind of a definitive whether the patient is truly having an MI. And in those cases, um, uh, CTA has the class 1A recommendations. I'm showing the European guidelines here because the US guidelines actually do not address this uh, uh, scenario. Uh, and I think the reason for that is there's supposed to be future guidelines on ACS that will capture this, but the current chest pain guidelines stayed out of the, this area of elevated troponin. So here's an example in our hospital, a 38-year-old male, chest pain, negative EKG, but mild elevation in his troponin. In this particular patient had a pleuritic component to his chest pain. His uh, clinical cardiology team thought that this is likely pericarditis. They were going to discharge him, but prior to discharge, they just wanted to be sure, so they got a coronary CTA. And interestingly, he had a near thrombotic occlusion of his proximal RCA. Um, we actually wondered if this could be a dissection, but this was a thrombotic uh, occlusion. Uh, and I think another important point here is that this is a patient who actually had atherosclerosis despite his young age. So even though he was 38, we also saw both calcified and non-calcified plaque in his LAD. Um, uh, and we actually saw a little bit in the RCA as well. So this is a patient that if you would have done a calcium score, perhaps uh, uh, weeks or months beforehand, you would have seen that he already has plaque despite his young age. Here's another patient uh, uh, during the COVID pandemic, 32-year-old uh, who uh, was admitted with COVID pneumonia, had chest pain, had elevated troponins, and has this EKG, which it could be actually pretty scary if you see this, uh, uh, ST elevations in V3, in V4, in V5. Uh, and I think for all the cardiology fellows in the audience, if you see this EKG in the middle of the night was a good story, you probably should activate the cath lab and not think about a coronary CTA. But of course, during the COVID pandemic, uh, we learned that many patients can have ST elevations and may not have obstructive disease. Um, and I actually first learned of this, as I do of many things on Twitter, 
there was this hashtag called COVID STEMI where people were posting their cases that looked a lot like STEMI and patients were were rushed uh, to the cath lab but had no obstructive disease. So sure enough, in in this patient, we did a coronary CTA uh, and it had no plaque or stenosis. In fact, during the COVID pandemic was the only time that our coronary CTA service was uh, open 24-7. We were asked by our hospital to cover it uh, at night and weekends to avoid uh, burdening our cath lab and to avoid unnecessary exposure of cath lab uh, uh, staff. Uh, so this is um, something that we saw uh, a fair amount of. But I would caution you, despite the last two cases where I think CTA was helpful, when someone uh, is at higher risk, when the troponin is elevated, many patients will not benefit from a coronary CTA. Uh, in one study, that uh, shows this is the DISCHARGE trial, which is a multi-center trial in the UK. Um, and in this trial, they actually enrolled a fairly high-risk population. Uh, not only did these patients all come with an acute coronary syndrome, but many of them had known coronary heart disease, including prior history of MI, cabbage, or PCI. And I think many know that coronary CTA is not as effective in that particular population. If a patient have stents, if a patient had a prior cabbage, their native coronaries are going to be heavily calcified. Uh, so certainly uh, CTA can be very helpful for the bypass grafts, but sometimes challenging for the natives. But if you're talking about a high-risk population with elevated troponins, uh, in this study here, when patients were followed for one year, uh, no difference in events between coronary CTA and standard of care. Now, of course, you could also say, why would there be a difference? Uh, uh, no imaging test that we do for patients with ACS, I would think, would really change therapy one year later. Um, I think for changing therapy, the main way to do that is preventive therapies, and that's not something that we see in one year, and certainly not something that would be observed in a population that many patients already are high risk. But nevertheless, I think that the bottom line point is uh, in higher risk patients, coronary CTA is not going to be helpful uh, for acute chest pain. Let's turn our attention to another topic in CT, which is FFRCT. Um, and here's a, a case together thinking about this. This is a 61-year-old cardiologist uh, who came to us with hypertension and hyperlipidemia. He had chest discomfort. He had a coronary CTA, which you can see on these images here. Uh, a uh, high resolution images, but in his uh, LAD, in his, in his mid LAD, a moderate stenosis, which is defined as 50 to 69%. And the question is when you see a moderate lesion, and this is true in the cath lab, it's also true on CT, is this flow limiting disease? And generally, it's kind of a 50 50, or what I uh, joke around with our fellows, I say it's a coin toss when you see moderate stenosis. It may be flow limiting, it may not. But one technique to discern this, uh, is FFRCT, which is a technique where we would use computational uh, fluid dynamics to estimate what the invasive FFR would be. So in this particular case, the invasive FFR is a 0.94 in the LED. And similar to invasive FFR, if this is more than 0.8, we would uh, call this a non-flow limiting lesion. Multiple uh, multi-center studies have uh, shown the accuracy of uh, FFRCT, that it compares favorably with invasive uh, FFR. Uh, and then another piece of data that I think is helpful is the advanced registry, which is not an accuracy study, but it's a registry that followed patients. And specifically, it showed that when patients have an FFRCT more than 0.8, which is normal, even when we don't uh, send those patients to the cath lab, their event rates are low. Conversely, when the FFRCT is abnormal, those patients have a higher uh, event rate. And I think this is important safety data that we can avoid invasive angiography when we have anatomical stenosis if the FFRCT is more than 0.8. Now, of course, a, a big question uh, that often comes is what is the difference between FFR and perfusion imaging? Uh, and actually, there's some been really nice uh, studies from Houston Methodist led by Moaz Almala in this area. But I think a reminder for our audience is that FFR, whether with CT or an invasively, is a lesion-specific measure of ischemia. And it may be a good measure to tell us who may uh, respond to revascularization of a specific lesion. On the other hand, myocardial perfusion imaging uh, is what the myocardium is actually seeing is your abnormalities in flow. And it's a measure that integrates flow throughout the entire coronary vessel tree and accounts for 
uh, maybe multiple lesions uh, in the fuse uh, disease and perhaps also, depending on the technique, microvascular disease. And it's not unexpected that these two measures are not always going to correlate. So if someone has a lot of diffuse disease and microvascular disease, they may have ischemia and myocardial perfusion imaging, but they don't have any one lesion that's abnormal by FFR. On the other hand, you can have a lesion that's abnormal by FFR, but if that's the only lesion and if the rest of the vessel is healthy and the microvasculature is healthy, you may have normal myocardial perfusion. So it should not be completely unexpected to see differences between these techniques. I wanna now cover uh, this topic and with consideration to FFRCT. When should we actually refer patients to the cath lab or for more testing after a CT? And I'm gonna use this slide from the chest pain guideline. First, let's, let's start with the question of who needs invasive angiography after a coronary CTA? And the answer is it's actually a small group. It's patients, first of all, who have obstructive, steno obstructive disease or stenosis if and only if they have high-risk anatomy, and that's defined in our guide as three-vessel disease or left main disease, or if they have frequent angina. Um, and this is important because we really need to think about how much angina individuals have before we send them to the cath lab, knowing that the main role of revascularization is to lower the burden of angina. But what if a patient has obstructive disease, it's not high-risk anatomy, the angina is not all that frequent, uh, and the question is, should we refer them to the cath lab? Well, the guidelines state that you can certainly choose to treat those patients with medical therapy alone. You do not need to do more testing for every patient that has stenosis. But if you want to do more testing, there's a class 2A recommendation, color-coded here in yellow for 2A. And the recommendation here is to consider either a stress test, whatever modality is available at your institution, or an FFR uh, CT. And specifically, as was done in the advanced registry, the, that window for FFR CT is for stenosis between 40 to 90%. So specifically, the recommendation for FFR CT uh, is on the right side of the slide. It's a 2A recommendation. It's for lesions that have 40 to 90% stenosis. Um, and also, we uh, noted in the text of the guideline that this is really or mid-vessel. So FFRCT does not work as well in distal uh, lesions. But if we have these 40 to 90 percent uh, uh, lesions, FFRCT can be useful to diagnose vessel-specific ischemia. A big question, and this was not available when we wrote this guideline, is how does this compare to stress testing after all, specifically with respect to outcomes, because that's what we care about the most. Well, um, the first uh, and only uh, study to evaluate this uh, was presented at the AHA, and this is not yet in, in, uh, in print, but this is the precise trial presented by Pam Douglas. And this was a, a large multicenter trial in patients with stable chest pain who are randomized to one of two strategies. The precision strategy is one where first the promise minimal risk score, which is a score derived from the promise study uh, that tells us which patients have low risk. And remember in the chest pain guideline, we stated that low risk patients don't need any testing. The testing can be deferred. And that's what this trial recommended as well for these low risk patients. But if they were not low risk, they went on to get a coronary CTA with selective use of FFRCT. Uh, and the FFRCT was, was performed in approximately a third of the patients here. On the other uh, arm here, patients were randomized to usual testing, which means that the clinician can choose any type of stress test. And this included a stress echo, a, a SPECT, PET, stress MRI, or ETT. So basically all the different tests that we use in contemporary cardiology. The endpoint here, death, non-fatal MI, or going to the cath lab and not having obstructive coronary disease. And some may ask, well, why, why include that third, third uh, part in the composite? Why not just study death or non-fatal MI? And I think for anyone observing the results of trials and stable chest pain, we know that the event rates, at least for heart events like death and MI, are so low that I don't think that would have been... Um, a, uh, a, a good endpoint to test, given that certainly the study would have been completely underpowered. Uh, and this is why that third endpoint, cath without obstructive coronary disease, was included. 
And the results of this study is that it showed a 70% reduction when the precision pathway was used in death, uh, non-fatal MI, or calf without obstructive disease. And as I sort of hinted at uh, on the last slide, the results of this were driven not by death or MI, but it was really driven by a reduction in patients who went to the cath lab and did not have obstructive disease. And I would say that's a relevant endpoint for our patients because going to the cath lab and being told you didn't have anything or at least anything obstructive, that, that is really considered an unnecessary invasive angiogram and avoiding that is probably a good thing. But avoiding that is now, I, I think, one of the at least uh, demonstrated uh, advantages of FFRCT, at least as shown by this trial. Let's now talk about quantitative uh, plaque analysis. We're going to shift gears to a different way that we use coronary uh, CTA. You may remember, unless you joined this talk late, the very first case I showed uh, when we opened this uh, talk today, this was the 59-year-old male who had uh, a large amount of plaque, or at least so we thought when we visually looked at this, and we recommended aggressive risk factor modification. Well, today there are techniques, and specifically there are three FDA-approved uh, vendors who will uh, do uh, uh, quantitative plaque analysis, and this is often using various AI techniques. And we actually sent the data from this uh, patient for one of those uh, analyses, and it's shown on this slide here. And this is an, a quantitative plaque analysis that shows the calcified plaque, non-calcified plaque, and total plaque in each vessel. And you can see on the bottom of this uh, slide here that the total amount of plaque is 241 cubic millimeters of plaque. And actually most of it for this patient was 216. So this was mostly non-calcified plaque. Of course, as you, you remember from this case, I'm gonna go back one, one slide here. There was a small amount of calcified plaque. So you can certainly state that maybe this, the fact that this patient has atherosclerosis could have been picked by a calcium score. Uh, but at least doing this quantitative plaque analysis or doing the coronary CTA also revealed that this is a patient who had a large burden of non-calcified plaque. Um, and this, of course, was something we saw visually and we reported, but it's something also we can now be able to evaluate in a quantitative fashion. Here's a, a different case, and this is a courtesy of a, of a colleague, Andrew uh, Choi at, at GW. And this is a 55-year-old male who also had plaque in his LED, uh, and a large proportion of it was non-calcified. But on this uh, slide here, we see examples both at baseline on the left side and after uh, medical therapy two years later on the right side. And what you can see here is a, is a reduction actually in the percent stenosis, which you can see visually uh, between this circle here and that circle there, as well as a reduction in the amount of plaque. And specifically when this was quantified, this was a 41% regression in non-calcified plaque. So I think this is a nice example. We certainly have uh, many such examples. Um, and I think this opens the door to this uh, concept that I think is very intriguing, which is whether we can, in the future, use coronary CTA to follow the results of our therapies to see if they are working. And this is certainly something that we use today in our uh, in clinical uh, trials, mostly in phase two trials and in a core lab, which I run, which we look at serial changes in plaque. But I certainly think that we're going to need more data before we employ this in clinical practice, because a common question is, when are we going to want to know if our therapies are working? Are we really going to want to do this for patients who are on statins, uh, who we lowered the LDL and are doing well? Or maybe we need to do this more for the more expensive uh, therapies. So certainly a lot more um, uh, questions in this area, but I think this is intriguing and something that certainly will have a role albeit perhaps a selective role in the future, who are the patients in whom we want to see if uh, they're actually having regression in their plaque. And I think it all depends also on the type of plaque because the non-calcified plaque is what regresses. Uh, when we talk about calcified other types of plaque and advanced stages of plaque, those uh, may be less modifiable. Another question is what about high risk uh, plaque? That's a common question. And uh, specifically, there's various uh, what we call high-risk plaque uh, features. Uh, and many of you know that in cardiology for a long time, there was this grail, holy grail, I would call it, for the vulnerable plaque. And I think we've kind of shifted our attention more to high-risk patients. But still, when we look at individual plaques, plaques that may have higher risk are ones that have a lower CT attenuation. 
which is a surrogate for lipid-rich plaque, perhaps plaque that have this so-called napkin ring sign, which is a, is a plaque that may have a necrotic core. Spotty calcium is probably not as strong of a high-risk plaque feature, but still uh, used in the literature. And then there's another one known as positive remodeling or Glagov remodeling, which is a sign for a large plaque uh, burden. And we have seen from both the Promise and Scott Hart, these are multi-center studies in stable chest pain patients, that when high-risk plaque features are present, patients generally have a higher level of risk. But I would also share with you a finding that I think is very important from the Scott Hart study, which is once you accounted for how much plaque individuals have, and this was done with a calcium score, uh, whether or not they had high-risk plaque features no longer added to risk prediction. So perhaps once we know how much plaque individuals have, the incremental role of high-risk plaque features might be smaller. Certainly, I think we need more, uh, more studies on this. I also think the way we uh, uh, quantify or at least determine high-risk plaques is going to change over time because right now we, we use binary classifications for a lot of these. But in the future, I think there's probably better opportunities to, to incorporate how we think about plaque, high-risk plaque on a more continuum uh, basis as opposed to on a binary basis. Um, I briefly uh, showed in the, the second case, uh, this is the patient with psoriasis, this technique known as fat attenuation index. This is something that's not yet FDA approved. So this is something we use only in the, on a research basis. But I also think this is intriguing to think about a future way that we can use CT and to look for inflammation. And the concept here is that when there's coronary inflammation, inflammation in the coronary arteries, that actually communicates with the epicardial fat via cytokines and results in more lipolysis and therefore more edema and therefore changes in the attenuation of the fat surrounding the coronary arteries. Uh, and ultimately, there may be some fibrosis within the fat, and that has a separate, separate signature as well. The uh, exciting part of uh, the work from, from this, and this is uh, mostly work that's been out of Oxford group, is that when uh, there is abnormal fat attenuation index, or what we call phi, when that uh, rate, that um, phi is high, patients have a higher rent rates. And in some of the studies, importantly, this has been incremental to calcium score and incremental to high-risk plaque features. And I think that's very important because there's a lot of high-risk features out there, but you always want to show that it's incremental to everything else we can get from a CT. And so far um, from uh, some of the studies uh, carried by Oxford, that this is incremental. Uh, and therefore, I think this will have an important role in the future, perhaps more so in patients with inflammation, perhaps for younger patients. Uh, but I think uh, there will be some exciting studies ahead in this area. Here's just as an example of this uh, in the uh, a slide of two patients from our institution. This was all done on a research basis. Uh, and these are two individuals who are 63. They both have systemic inflammatory conditions. They both actually had the exact same amount of plaque in their coronaries, but one patient on the left had a very high level of inflammation. The other one on the right was just uh, uh, kind of close to the to the average, uh, and therefore this kind of shows us perhaps we can use this in the future to identify patients who may benefit from anti-inflammatory therapies. Let's now, uh, for the last part of the talk, we're gonna talk about whether we can use coronary CTA for asymptomatic individuals. I think this is um, always a, a, a controversial but important area to discuss. Um, and I think the first question you can ask is, what is the yield of actually using coronary CTA in asymptomatic populations? And I think the two best uh, studies to answer that question are the SCAPIS study that was done in Sweden and the Miami Heart Study, which Dr. Nasir uh, led, done in Miami. And in both of these studies, you can see that the, the conclusion from these studies uh, uh, from SCAPIS was that silent atherosclerosis is common. And from the Miami Heart Study, the conclusion was that substantial prevalence of plaque was present. And specifically, plaque was present in these studies in 42% and 49%. So nearly half the population, uh, asymptomatic patients, all in their 50s. Um, and I, I think I might have the, the age wrong here in the Miami Heart Study, but the average was still in the, in the 50s. But in both of those populations, uh, plaque was present in nearly half the patients. Uh, but also an important question is, how often do patients have plaque with a calcium score of zero? Because after all, those may be the patients where doing a coronary CTA would be uh, additive to a calcium score. And in the SCAPIS study, that was only 5.4% of the patients. 
Uh, in the Miami Heart Study, that was about 16% of the patients. And even in those cases, we could argue, well, what is actually the prognostic value of having a calcium score of zero in identifying plaque in a coronary CTA? And I think we're going to need some more time to follow these cords to answer that. But based on some studies we have, at least today, with shorter follow-up, we can say that it's debatable whether finding non-calcified plaque in asymptomatic patients who have a calcium score of zero adds to prognosis. And I I think certainly um, doing a coronary CTA gives you more information. You can quantify not just calcified plaque, but also non-calcified plaque and look at plaque features and maybe in the future look at this fat attenuation index. But ultimately, the big question is, should we do this? Um, And you can argue that the cost of uh, CTA is low and the radiation is low. And you can pose this question, why not do coronary CTA for primary prevention? Well, the advantages are that some patients may have a higher burden of non-calcified plaque. Uh, And specifically, those populations are patients with systemic inflammatory diseases, um, uh, uh, for example, lupus or psoriasis or or, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, Also, patients with HIV, they have a high burden of non-calcified plaque. And knowing that when a patient has a high burden of non-calcified plaque may enhance risk assessment. The limitations, of course, on the other end of the spectrum of why we should not use coronary CTA for all asymptomatic individuals is that it's going to cost more money. Um, But I think the biggest limitation is uh, this uh, concern that if you do coronary CTA in asymptomatic individuals and you find, let's say, a mild or moderate stenosis, the type of patient that a Houston Methodist, everybody knows all they need is medical therapy. There's a concern that when they go to other institutions and other places, individuals who may not be familiar with the CT results may say, oh, we need to do a stress test or or even worse, you need to, to, to go to the cath lab. So this excess downstream testing uh, that may result from CTA. Of course, maybe we can just educate our clinicians uh, in our community how to use these results and avoid that. But in the meanwhile, uh, the the study that hopefully will will shed a little bit of light on this is the Scott Hart 2. And this is an ongoing study right now uh, in the UK evaluating the role of CTA in asymptomatic patients randomized to CTA or usual testing. So for my last couple slides, I'm just going to close with a couple future perspectives. And uh, first, Even before the chest pain guideline, we've seen a a large growth in use of coronary CTA. And this slide here shows that in the Medicare beneficiaries. But I think there's a couple other factors of why coronary CTA is going to continue to grow over time and not just because of the chest pain guideline or some of the clinical studies I showed you. One of them is the fact that the technology keeps on improving. And on this slide here is an example, and this is from St. Francis Hospital, of the the latest generation of CT scanners known as photon counting CT scanners. Uh, And this is a technique that uh, gives much better resolution to the CT because you can actually look at the energy of every photon. Uh, So our detectors are much better. And this is really revolutionary and a very different concept of how older uh, CT scanners uh, work. And the advantage of better resolution, his ability to get better images when there's calcium, when there's stents, when there's patients in the past that we would not think of referring for CT. Of course, as CT grows, uh, I think a a challenge we have in the field is that we actually don't have enough uh, uh, qualified readers. Uh, And yes, every cardiology fellow needs to train in cardiac CT to achieve COCAPS level one. Uh, But I urge uh, all the fellows to actually get more advanced training, not just level one, but level two, which means that you actually are uh, qualified to read these studies. I think it's an important skill, just as reading nuclear cardiology and echo. I think cardiac CT now is an essential skill that every uh, cardiology uh, fellow should learn. Finally, I think the other reason why CT will grow is that we're actually using CTA more and more in clinical trials. Um, And I'm not talking about phase two trials to see whether there's changes in plaque, but I'm talking about phase three trials uh, as we are including patients in trials who have plaque. And here's an example from the Vesalius trial. This is an ongoing trial to evaluate the efficacy of evolocumab, a PCSK9 inhibitors, in patients who have not yet had an MI or stroke, which is different um, from prior studies done. Uh, So this is more of a close to a primary prevention population. But in this particular study, they're using both calcium score and CTA, among other means, to identify patients with atherosclerosis. Uh, 
And this is something that will be done more and more in future trials that we use CT to identify high risk primary prevention, and I would put primary in quotation marks because we can always argue, is this truly primary prevention? So I showed all these fancy uh, slides, uh, and I think at the end of the day, I want to come back to the message of how should I select patients for coronary CTA, and, and in, I think it's most useful in patients who do not have known coronary disease when we can get good image quality, and those are really the two important metrics for me. Um, Obviously, if you cannot get good image quality because a patient is morbidly obese uh, or if there's massive calcifications or small overlapping stents, CT is not a good uh, technique. And you can think about it, uh, many other options in the stress lab. The conclusion allows us to have accurate detection of plaque and stenosis can improve out in the study. Uh, led to a 40% reduction in CHD death or MI. FFRCT may help avoid unnecessary invasive angiograms. It does require good image quality. Plaque analysis will enable us to better assess risk and perhaps uh, for some patients evaluate whether they are adequately responding to medical therapy. It's also going to help us select patients for clinical trials and ultimately if those trials are successful, select patients for various uh, uh, therapies, and I'm not just talking about stents here, but I'm talking about more expensive, uh, more selective therapies. And finally, advances in technology, both uh, AI to uh, help us with the interpretation and in the future, the acquisition of CT and improvement in hardware using photon counting uh, CT will further expand the capabilities, the image quality, and ultimately the impact of cardiac CT. Thank you all very much. Ron, uh, thank you so much. It was a uh, great, um, I would say, going through everything. This is a recording that I'm going to share with all of my fellows, whatever is needed to be known about CTA in one hour. So, you know, your talk highlighted one of the key take home for me was, Ron, is it seems like, of course, non-obstructive plaque is critically important um, from a prognostic standpoint, manage, managing treatment. And then, of course, now we have ability to characterize a lot of plaque and plaque features and automatize the plaque burden assessment. But also I took home that, you know, in the end, it's the plaque burden that seems to predominant as far as prognosis and your risk is concerned. So from your perspective, where do you see the value of black characterization once you account a certain amount of black from a management risk perspective assessment and modifying your management? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really good question. Um, and I think there is a lot of hype about high-risk plaque features probably five to 10 years ago. Um, and I think that hype has been dampened a little bit, or at least my, <laughs> my, my enthusiasm for this has been dampened. Um, uh, I think we'll have better ways to assess some of these plaque features using the current kind of AI techniques, because I think in the past, also the other problem was that this was not always um, uh, a reliable measure um, in terms of how different people would interpret high-risk plaque features. Uh, it's something that's done visually, as I mentioned, it's it's binary. So maybe in the future, if we have better techniques to assess high-risk plaque features, uh, maybe there'll be some value there. And I do believe there'll be some role, but overall the role, the incremental role of that beyond plaque burden is going to be small and we will need to study that. We cannot just assume for any measure, just because it shows that a higher risk group that it's actually incremental to everything else we have. So I think a lot more studies are needed in that. But today, I think we have very solid data that the overall amount of plaque is by far a stronger predictor of risk than these high risk plaque features. Perfect. So uh, one question was uh, more around your guidance and, you know, clearly no one test is superior, but how do you choose the most appropriate patient? And uh, in all honesty, I took a snapshot of uh, that slide and would like to share it with all the residents and fellows. The question I have is, how can we optimize testing, especially in the real world? Do you think there are some tools, applications, that can be applied as physicians are ordering these tests because we still see a lot of stress tests in the young population. And even 
um, some of our colleagues do highlight the fact that individuals with prior stents, elderly, very elderly patients get the CTA. So how can we optimize that from a health system perspective, considering that now you're also leading the effort with the combined mass genin and Brigham in, in these areas? Yeah, I, th I think it's a really challenging area in, you know, um, 15 years ago, I actually wanted to do research in this area. And I said, okay, I'm going to develop an algorithm. It's going to be a compute at the time of order entry that will just help people select what test to do. Um, and actually what we found, we tried to do this at Brigham. It was actually a very complex algorithm because this is not a simple thing. So um, in radiology, for example, there's sometimes algorithms on how do you choose between a, a, a head CT or a, a brain MRI. And I think it's a little more straightforward. For cardiovascular imaging, if you actually try to develop an algorithm, first of all, it's not going to hold in all the institutions because different institutions have different types of tests and different strengths. But even if your own institution, if you sit down and you try to draw an algorithm, how are you going to send people to different modalities? It's pretty complex. It's not something that you can easily uh, kind of distill down to like three or four questions at the time of order entry. Um, so I, I think today, uh, one of the best things to do is actually to talk to your imaging uh, colleagues. We have an imaging consultation service. And of course, at Houston Methodist, you have some of the world leaders in this area. So you, you can talk, you have a question about a pet, you can go talk to Dr. Moaz Almala. Um, you can, you can talk to really any of the imagers. I think all your imagers are really well-trained in multimodality and ask their, their input. But some of the things that I would urge people, kind of basic things is always look at prior imaging. What was done and was it helpful? Look at a prior chest CT. If there's uh, a lot of coronary calcifications, uh, think about a stress test. If, if there aren't a lot of coronary calcifications, I, I would think about a coronary CTA. Um, if someone has diffuse disease and you know they have non-obstructive disease and they have pain, I think a PET with quantification of blood flow would be fantastic. If you're thinking about myocardial diseases, maybe they also have LV dysfunction and you want to also assess for not, for, for various non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, I think an MRI would be by far the best test. But sometimes just a treadmill test alone might be a good test. If you already know that they have disease, you're on the fence, should you send them to the cath lab? You're not sure how much angina they have. Just put them on a treadmill and see how what's their exercise capacity and how much angina they have. That might be good as well. So, um, and obviously stress echo, you have a phenomenal uh, stress echo lab. Sometimes if you're looking for valvular disease, uh, uh, in whether that gets worse with activity, stress echo. If you are uh, thinking about three vessel disease, perhaps uh, uh, the SPECT or PET were inconclusive because there's reduction in flow in all the different vessels. And you say, this could be three vessel disease. At the end of the day, sometimes a stress echo to see does the ventricle balloon out with activity that can be very specific for three vessel disease. So the bottom line is it's, it's, uh, it's not always uh, that simple and there's a lot of options. But at least for CTA, think if you can get a good quality CTA, if there's no prior history of coronary disease, that's where CTA is going to be most impactful. That, that was wonderful. So Ron, one final question, and this is more philosophical now with the rapid advancements that happening in AI and AI-based automatized plaque quantification, and I'm sure the qualitative quantification can happen. Now you're leading the ACC charge on imaging. So a question for you in future, do we need more cardiac imagers or less? I think we need more if we actually look at the volume. And I think anyone who's an imager who's uh, who's looking knows that uh, your volumes volumes are high in most institutions, uh, myself included, uh, actually don't have enough raters. So we need imagers, but we also need those imagers to be very good cardiologists to help us understand how to put the results of imaging into patient management. And AI is helping us, but it's certainly not taking away our jobs and it's certainly not making us uh, do our work uh, and be done by noon because uh, we still need to know how to interpret the results of AI. So actually, um, it, it, it provides us more data, but I'm not sure it makes our day any shorter. Perfect. Thank you, Ron. Wonderful conversation. Really appreciate joining us today. And hopefully we, we can host you in person at some point in future. Thanks again for joining and everybody else who's here with us today. Thank you all.